uh, this series this morning uh, called Real Faith. And uh, this is going to be part five this morning. So if you miss some of the other messages, you can go online. They're on our church website. They're on Facebook. Uh, you can grab them. Uh, some of our previous services, they're either in full service or they're just sermon only. Uh, you can uh, do what suits you if you want to catch up just with the messages. It's up to you. But in this season, how many of you know that we need faith? We need to be able to trust God. And so uh, we looked at Abraham in, deep into his life, and I could have done more, but I'm going to this morning look at the person of Daniel. So if you want to turn your Bibles to Daniel chapter 6, and uh, I will get there in just a moment to our text uh, while you're turning. Let me just uh, begin. And I just feel an urgency this morning to, in the day and age of which we live, to Take some time to equip you and your spirit for decisions you're going to have to face, things you're going to have to face as we go forward and face them uh, in faith. So as we begin this morning, I'm going to ask this question. How strong are you? I'm not asking about how heavy of a box you can lift. I'm not asking about how much you can bench press. I'm asking you when the chips are down, when the pressure's on, when there's disagreement, how strong are you to stand on what you believe? That's what we're going to talk about. <clears throat> and then what basis do you stand strong? A time is coming, I believe, that you may not be able to be silent anymore as a believer. You know how we can, if we want to just kind of skate back, we don't have to say what we believe. We can just let the, the noise go around us and, and we don't have to speak up. I want to tell you, I think the days of silence are behind us. Um, and I, I just felt prompted by the Holy Spirit to challenge us uh, in this way this morning. Uh, we're facing a situation right now in our country that um, there is a... I know that it's not all out in the news yet, but there is a, from what we see in the news, what's been announced, that there's a, a I want to, in my opinion, a 40% chance that what we see in the news is going to change and the call for president is going to be reversed. If that happens, there is going to be major disruption in our country. And I, I, I just told the Holy Spirit to prompt me so that I can prepare you. That you can stand. That you can have a sense of faith to stand. It was last night reported that the head, what head, head uh, produ pr a person of uh, production and, and strategy for Dominion Software, which is controlling a lot of the, the uh, machines, uh, in the midst of that, he said in September that Trump will not win. And that has just come out in magnitude last night in the news about 10.30 at night. So, and he's connected with Antifa. There is multiple things that are going to transpire. So the issue is we don't know how this is going to turn out. It could be as it is. And if it is as it is and as we see it, so just think about it. We haven't heard about some things in the last four years. They're, they're going to resurface. There's things that are coming out like let's get rid of airplanes. Let's get rid of cows. I mean stuff that is just bizarre. The Green New Deal, based on something called climate change. I want you to think about these things for a moment. I don't normally talk about them in church. I'm going to get to help you understand this from God's word in just a moment and what the relevancy is. So let's just talk about this for a moment. So you think about the idea of climate change. I'll just give you the essence of, of climate change is uh, that uh, scientists believe that the climate is changing and it's warming, etc., etc., which there's half of the scientists believe that's true, half of the scientists believe there isn't. If you look at data, there is 100 years where the, the climate has changed just like the Great Lakes. The, the levels go up and down over a course of years, and it just changes over a period of time. Um, there's one thing that is for certain from the Bible that the temperature is going to go up the closer that we get to Jesus' return. Look at Acts chapter 2. There is an essence where the temperature will go up. And that is, but it's a sign of Jesus' return. It's a biblical event, not a political event. If you think about that. Uh, and I know that for those who turn against God and want to be God themselves, the temperature of hell is getting hotter and hotter. 
Just think about it for a moment. Think about the subject of climate change. You just process in your own thinking. Do you think that somehow God has lost control? Didn't God create this world anyway? Do you think somehow, somewhere along the line, that God has lost his ability to, to stabilize the atmosphere and stabilize our world? Do you, do you think that God is that weak, that somehow we've got to put ourselves in place of God, and because, God, you are kind of weak, we've got to take over for you because, you, God, you just really can't do your job. It's really an assault on who God is, if you really think about it. And you think about those that are purporting, uh, pushing this stuff, if you really get down to the core of it, they don't believe in God. They believe their God. We believe in God. We trust God. We have real faith in God. And so we have to stand in faith. So this message title is Real Faith, Part 5. And I'm going to talk to you for a few moments out of Daniel 6, having a faith to stand in the day and time in which we live. Faith to stand. So let me just tell you the background here of Daniel chapter 6, and then we're going to read part of our text in just a second. But God had brought judgment on Jerusalem. Jerusalem, if you understand, was at that time, biblical times, a part of Judah. And uh, it is today, currently, modern-day Israel and some of the surrounding areas was or, or the land of Canaan at that period of time. So they had God's people. Now notice this, God's people, not secular culture. God's people, their heart had become lukewarm, and they had become like the culture around them. Does that sound anywhere familiar? They had, now listen to this, they had slowly turned their backs on God. We don't turn our backs and flip one day. It's a slow progression of descent. They slowly had turned their backs on God, and God brought judgment by allowing a wicked country, or you might want to say a godless country of Babylon, which today is in modern-day Iraq, in that area, over by the Tigris-Euphrates River, just, just north of the Persian Gulf. And we know about those because of current events, or, or past current events. And so Babylon was going to come now, King Nebuchadnezzar, to take over Israel, Jerusalem. And then what he did is he, was, he took all of their possessions and their families and took them as exiles, captives, you want to use the word immigrants, refugees, into Babylon. And they were going to be subservient to that culture there. And that's what they were experiencing. So Daniel um, was taken with them. Daniel at that time was a young man. And in, in fact, we don't even know, we believe that the possibility that he was separated from his family at that time, and he was taken by himself into Babylon, and there he stood as a young man. But he made a decision, Daniel believed, even as a young man at the time, with those exiles, he made a decision in that godless culture of Babylon to honor God with his life and face in the face of the godless culture of Babylon itself. So, God's word teaches us about Daniel's daring faith to stand in a godless culture. In the last two weeks, one of our Supreme Court justices, Sam Alito, he made the statement that we are on the brink of losing our religious freedom in America. That's from a Supreme Court justice of the United States said that within the last two weeks. And he said it with alarm in a lecture that he gave, and I could expand from that. He said religious liberty, in his words, is under attack. You see it. We know it. Let me give you a summary, and then we're going to read several verses here. So Dan Daniel was this young man, this exile, immigrant, captive. Daniel was strong in God. Are you strong in God this morning? If not, I pray that by the end of this message, there'll be a new determination in your life. Daniel had spiritual insight. And unbelievable, God used him in such a spiritual discernment. He interpreted a dream. God gave him evidence of his life, and he interpreted a dream for King Nebuchadnezzar, and then he had interpreted a dream for King Belshazzar. He was that spiritually, had that much spiritual intuitiveness and spiritual gifting that he, in spiritual insight, that, and tuned into God, that God gave him the abilities to do that. He rose in ranks and he became one of three governors over the province of Babylon. Uh, there are other, and we're going to read in our, our text in a second, that some of the other government officials were called satraps. It just means that they were government officials. 
they, and some of these other governors, other satraps, they formed a conspiracy. Huh, sounds like our modern politics, doesn't it? Uh, they got a decree signed by the king that anyone who prayed for 30 days would be thrown in to the lion's den. This is a story that you and I have heard from the time that if you've been in church in almost any denomination uh, up, upbringing, Daniel in the lion's den. Anybody who prayed, the threat, if you prayed, even in your own home, you're going to get thrown into a lion's den. Well, that didn't stop Daniel. He went against government. He went against authorities. He went against decrees. And in his own home, he prayed, and we know that he was thrown into the den. So um, <clears throat> let's just read our text now, beginning at verse 10 of Daniel chapter 6. This whole text, this whole uh, uh, chapter, I can't take the time to read it all this morning, but it applies to this message. And I'm going to refer to different parts as we walk through these few minutes we have together. But Daniel chapter 10. So the, the, the decree has been given. In verse 10, it picks up the story. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room, this is in his house, with his windows open towards Jerusalem. Now, I want to tell you that this is, he's praying, the point is, he's praying in his home. We have, you have faced this in your life this week. They've told you to not have family gatherings in your home. The governor of one state, he said, you need to all wear masks in your home. Another governor of another state, he says that you shouldn't talk too loudly in your home. We have dear people that are in this room that came from Russia. They're part of our congregation. Does this sound familiar? Intrusion in the home. The government of Babylon was, uh, uh, the, these, these, the, the conspiracy, they said, Daniel, you can't pray in your own home. We see it intruding on us. And here's what the issue is. The, the issue I talked to you about climate change and the issue I, uh, uh, the extremes with coronavirus is a problem. Don't get me wrong. It's a problem. It's an issue. And, uh, but the issue is it's using these things to gain control over your personal lives. How many, how many are glad that Jesus came to set us free? And we have, we've had in the past, America has been a very free place. And there's these balances between being careful of things and our personal freedoms. And, and, and they have to be stewarded. They have to be managed. But it's when governments are trying to use these crises to gain control over your lives. And that's what they were doing here. Because they didn't like Daniel's God. So it says, so that he's in his home. He's in the upper room with his windows open. He didn't try to hide the fact. He says his windows open towards Jerusalem. He knelt down on his knees three times a day. And he prayed and he gave thanks before his God. He hardly knows this decree that if anybody prays, he's going to go to, to, to be thrown in with the lions. What was his attitude in the midst of this pressure? It says that he still gave thanks to God. That's amazing. What pressure are you going through in this room right now? I don't care what, all of us in this room, if we were to ask, get down and had a personal conversation, there's pressure in every one of our lives about something. Can you thank God today on this Thanksgiving week? Oh, there's so many things that we can thank God about. How many of you are thankful for your friends, thankful for family, thankful for church, uh, thankful for the toys you have, the, the, the hobbies you have, thankful for the cars that you drive and the work that you have. And I mean, I could just go on and on. There is so many things that we can be thankful for. Thankful for our health, thankful for uh, so many things, our strength that we have. We can be thankful. But Daniel's faced under this tremendous pressure and his attitude is one of thanks. And he did this three times as was his custom. He didn't change pattern even though this decree came out. Verse 11. It says, Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. They found him and he was praying. He was guilty. Pick it up, uh, the story in verse 16. So, so the, the king, the king had made a decision. He got them to talk him into signing this thing. He was sick about it. He liked Daniel. And he was sick of it about his own decision. It says in verse 16, So the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve continually, he'll deliver you. He go, he, just before they're ready to put him in, he, and the, the king went up to the lion's den with Daniel. And he whispers to Daniel, says, Hey, Daniel, your God will deliver He'd hardly begin to have faith. The king did. He says, your God 
who you serve. He's going to deliver you from this mess that I helped get you in. I love it. Verse 17. Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signets of his lords, and the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. In other words, they were going to go through with it. The king takes his ring over that that seal of that den, and he, he locks him in and confirms that he's in that, but knowing he, he, he serves a God that can deliver him. Verse 18 says, Now the king went to the palace and spent the night fasting. <laughs> That's some king, goes and spends the night fasting. Uh, and no musicians were brought before him. Also his sleep went from him. He was deeply disturbed by his own decision. Verse 19, Then the king arose very early in the morning, and he went with haste, and he ran to the den of lions. And he, when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting. It meant a grieving voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lions? And then Daniel said, ha, huh, he heard, said something. He was, he was alive. Oh, king, live forever. Can you imagine the king hearing those words? Oh, king, live forever from the pit of that d- a lion's den. My God sent his angels and shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him and also, O king, I've been done nothing wrong before you. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatsoever was found on him because he what? He believed in God. Do you believe in God this morning? The same God that delivered Daniel can deliver you too. Now look at this. What happened to the conspirators? This is really good. Look at verse 24. I love this. It says, and the king gave the command, and they brought those men who had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den, lions, uh, them with their children and their wives, and the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. The conspirators lost their lives in the den that was meant for Daniel. It's an incredible story of scripture. So as we look at this, this is our key verse in this message, verse 23. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury was found uh, on him because why? He believed in his God. This morning in this room, I want to take these few moments that I have. I just want to just elevate your belief in God that you can believe that the God who raised Daniel up out of the den can cause you to stand and he can deliver you no matter what conversations you get in the midst of, no matter what trouble you get in the midst of, God can deliver you. How many are glad that we believe in that kind of God? That's real faith. Daniel's faith is described in several ways in this passage of scripture. I want to encourage, I don't care what your age is in this room. You're older, you're middle-aged, you're a young person, you're watching online, it doesn't matter. You know what? We can all have the same faith. I know Daniel is maybe a little young and, and you, you got some, some daring face sometimes when you're young and sometimes as we get older we know a little bit more, but God's calling us all to raise our level of faith. And so let's strengthen our faith in these next few moments, in these last few moments we have together in this culture. So his faith is described. So number one this morning, let me, this this text describes this level of faith that Daniel had, this level of believing in his God. Number one, the text here records these words, that Daniel had an excellent spirit. Daniel had an excellent spirit. Who in your house is a steady hand when things get emotional, they get rocky, they get upsetting, or a tough decision has to be made? Don't raise your hand, okay? Who's that in your house? And I realize that life rocks all of us different, and sometimes somebody's got to be strong. And at one time in another party in the home, a spouse, somebody else has to be strong. Maybe sometimes the house is so rocky and a kid has to be strong. But who's strong in your house? Who in your house has an excellent spirit? The issue is God wants us all to be there. God wants to move us all there. And that's what the challenge of this message this morning. 
Now, I wanted to say this about Daniel. Think about it for a moment. He could have been bitter. He had been taken out of his homeland, out of Jerusalem, and he was taken and he was displaced without family, most, most scholars believe. Without his family, on his own, he could have been bitter. He could have taken on the victim mentality and say, look what happened to me. Look what I have had to go through. Look what I had to give up. Look where they took me. He could have started blaming everybody, or he could have said, oh, poor me. And I want to tell you, when you take on the victim mentality, it, life becomes all about you. I heard the saying, and maybe I've said it from a pulpit before. I, I heard it's not original with me. But when you become a victim, you become your own oppressor. Ooh, think about that. Daniel, he could have been that kind of person. After all that he's faced here recently. But no, the scripture here says of his faith, he had an excellent spirit. Here's the text. It says in Daniel 6, 3. Look at what it says. It's on your screen. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and the satraps because an excellent spirit was in him and the king gave thought of setting him over the whole realm. Can I ask you this morning, do you sense in your, do you have an excellent spirit? Maybe you say, Pastor, I'm growing. I want to just challenge you to grow into that excellent spirit this morning. What does this mean? I looked it up in both the Hebrew and in Webster's. Here's some words that are used for this kind of spirit. An extraordinary spirit, an outstanding spirit, an exceptional spirit, spirit, a brilliant spirit. You ever get around people like that? And when the chips are down and the pressure's on, they're just like solid gold. Maybe it's a boss at your work. Maybe it's a grandma or grandpa that you know. Maybe it's an uncle or an aunt. Maybe it's somebody in your own house. Maybe it's a teenager. Whoever it is. And you look at them and say, man, they have an excellent spirit. I want to challenge you in the midst of your faith. Let's be like Daniel. No matter all of our conversations we have at home. And we all go through peaks and valleys. We all do. We're real people in this room. But let's strive to have this kind of faith that Daniel had. You know what? He had an excellent spirit because he knew his God. He knew God was going to take care of things. That's the kind of spirit he had. I'm challenging you to possess this kind of spirit in your life. It says in verse 4 of Daniel, it says that he lived right before God and before his fellow men. It says there that there was no fault found in Daniel. Can I just challenge, challenge you, church, in that excellent spirit? Can we, can we live right before God? Can we honor God with our decisions, our actions, our choices? The culture is just crazy. It's just doing everything that dishonors God, that pleases, that lives in sin, unashamedly, whatever. I'm challenging you. Can you live your life in a way that honors God? Make the decisions, the choices. Let's live our lives and avoid sin and live a life that honors God. It's all around us. And before our fellow men. I hope that you in this room, I hope you're hard workers at your jobs. You're, you're, you, you do well for the people that you work with in service. I heard somebody say it this way. He was trying to teach his kids how to be workers. He said, go to work. And he says, treat your bosses like your clients. In other words, you serve them to do the very best that you can. I pray that you're that kind of people in this room. Daniel was that. He, was, he honored God. And he honored his fellow man in his responsibilities. The, the king, he was recognized. They were going to advance him because of the way he handled himself. Daniel had spiritual insight. It says in chapter 5, verse 12, he could interpret dreams. He had spiritual awareness, a spiritual keenness. You know what? In this day and age, with what we're going through, because some of us can numbly go through. We watch the news and say, well, this must be so. This must be so. And I want to tell you, you have to have a spiritual discernment now like you never have before. What's going on? I talked to you about some things earlier. You say, Pastor, I never thought of it that way. Begin to discern. Begin to ask the Lord. Lord, show me. Allow your, the Holy Spirit to direct your mind that you have spiritual discernment. We use the, utilize the gifts of the Spirit and begin to discern the signs of the times. Uh, the, the scripture said in the Old Testament, Issachar, he knew the times and he knew what to do. Trust the Holy Spirit. Rely on the Holy Spirit to point you in the right way, to have a right sense of discernment in the cancel culture and everything else that we're dealing with in, in, our, in our lives, the stuff you hear in the news and from politicians. Daniel had this spiritual insight, and to a secular king, 
God used him to even interpret dreams to those who didn't even know God or honor God. Daniel knew God, and he knew God was strong. He prayed in this situation in his home, and he thanked God. There's a song that maybe you've heard on the radio, and I, it catches my ear every time I hear it and listen to Christian radio all the time, going driving in the car. And it's, it's, it's a song, maybe Chris, Pastor Chris, you know it, uh, by Josh Baldwin. It's called Something About the Evidence of the Goodness of God. I, I got the song messed up. Maybe you've heard it on the radio. There's evidence all around of the goodness of God. And that was the attitude that Daniel had, even though he was under threat and under this difficult situation. I was talking to someone yesterday, another pastor from another state. He said, we either need a revival in our country or we need the rapture. We need one of the two of them. And I think he was right. We need a spiritual awakening. We need a spiritual awakening. But it's going to come from an excellent spirit within the body of Christ and saying, Lord, we just need you to come and visit us in a special way. Sue and I were talking about the dates, in fact, uh, this morning, just getting ready, about before America was formed in 1776, some of the great awakening came in the years just prior to that, in the 1730s, 1740s, by, by uh, uh, these men, George Whitfield, John Wesley, Charles Wesley, that it's amazing that some of their hymns are sang, still sang today, uh, that, that, that it was a great awakening, but it was that, that awakening came before the birth of America, uh, and it came in that period of time, an awakening ca came. So there's... <clears throat> It, 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 so here's what we got to understand about Daniel. Another thing that gave him an excellent spirit. He did the right things. He, he lived his life in a right way. But the spirit of God was in him. Look at uh, chapter 5 and verse 14. It's up on your screen. You can look at it later in your Bible. It says this, I've heard of you. And this is, this is uh, King Belshazzar speaking to him. He says, I've heard of you, Daniel. That the spirit of God is in you. And that the light of understanding and an excellent wisdom are found in you. I want to tell you, all of us in this room, let's carry the Spirit of God in our lives as a treasure. Here, the king recognized it. Let, do others recognize the Spirit of God in you? Are they recognizing that you're a possessor, a carrier of the Spirit of God? Do they recognize it in your life? There needs to be a new awareness, a new consciousness of it. Uh, Daniel, they, the, the king here recognized that the Spirit of God is in Daniel. And I pray that people would recognize that of you in your workplace, your home, your neighborhood, wherever it might be in your life. Daniel had an excellent spirit. One more thing I want to say about this. Uh, you, you might think, okay, Pastor. Daniel was one of these people that have a thick hide. They got thick skin. Nothing touches their emotions. Nothing worries them or nothing concerns them. But the scripture tells us, if you study Daniel's life, that that's not the case. An alarming vision came. Uh, that was uh, dealt with, I think, relating to King Belshazzar and, and Antichus, who was an area leader. And the, 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 the vision that Daniel received, it was so disturbing that this is, that he took it into his emotions. Because I, I want to dispel this fact that Daniel was somehow one of these hardened guys that just, like, no feeling. You, 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 Pat, you know, you, some people are that way. They just, have, they just have a toughness to their skin. They just have a thickness to their hide. I, I, I don't know how to think of that. I'm not going to get into that. Okay, you can think about that later. But, but here's what it says in Daniel chapter 8 about how his, his emotional makeup was. In this other vision, this troubling vision about this wicked king, uh, wicked leader, uh, 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 Antichus, says, I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days after I rose and went to the, king, and I went to, to the king's business. So what was his attitude in this other situation that alarmed him? It says he was sick for days and he fainted. He felt the emotion. All of you in this room, you know, we all have different emotions that we react to different things and we get upset and frustrated and angry about different things and emotional about different things. Daniel did too, but he maintained an excellent spirit in the midst of it. His faith was real. He believed in God. He knew ultimately all these things could upset him, but he knew and he trusted God. Number two, I'm not going to get through all this message this morning. I'm going to speak about another five minutes and then we're going to pick it up next, next week. Number two, Daniel stood strong in the face of peers, authorities, and decrees. Daniel stood strong in the face of peers, authorities, and decrees. You think about his friends in Daniel chapter 3, and Daniel had already interpreted a dream for King Nebuchadnezzar. They became recognized, and, and uh, they had eaten the right things. Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, his friends, and they weren't going to eat all the king's delicacies, and they honored God. And, and, but anyway, 
they decided to build a statue. Nebuchadnezzar built a 90-foot statue. Remember, remember when Iraq fell and that big statue of, of uh, Saddam Hussein came down? Well, that was probably 20 feet tall. Back in this biblical account, the image that was built of Nebuchadnezzar was 90 feet tall. And a decree went out that they were all supposed to bow down. I'm in Daniel chapter 3 now. They were all to bow down and worship this statue of King Nebuchadnezzar that was 90 foot tall. Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they said, we're not bowing down. We're not going to do it. Word got back that those three Hebrew, Hebrew kids, they're not going to bow down. They didn't bow down to that statue. And so the king heard of it. He was mad. He says, he said, I want you to turn up the furnace seven times hotter. Seven times. There's, there's climate change for you, okay? And turn up the furnace seven times hotter. And they turned that up and they threw his three friends in that thing. And all of a sudden, the workers, and it says that the guys that threw them in, they died because that flame was so hot. But when they got thrown in, the people that were observing, they said, we see a fourth man like the Son of God in there with them, and he's there to deliver them, and he raises them up out. Even though a decree was good, they stood for God, their faith was in God, and God delivered them. They were, they were his friends in Daniel's church that were encouraged to bow down to a statue by decree. We see a lot of decrees flying around in, in stuff like that right now. Daniel had to stand alone in his culture through a conspiracy that was in this Daniel chapter 6. These guys didn't like Daniel. They didn't like Daniel's God. And they got the king to sign a decree that he regretted later. It was a conspiracy to go at him and his God. And when he got to this, his upper room, to his prayer room, he knew what the decree was, that you can't, you can't pray. What did Daniel do? Despite the culture, despite the pressure, despite the government, no matter what they said, he said, in my home, I'm going to pray. And I'm going to thank God. And I want to tell you, you and I are facing these in our time and in our day that you are going to have to make a decision. Are you going to follow the government? Are they going to be your God or is God going to be your God? And I'm talking about whoever, part, whoever party's leading. This is just a little side note here. Do you know how to pray? I trust you do. I trust that you know how to pray. Our light's going out. There we go. Yeah, Satan doesn't like it when we, we pray. Can I challenge all of you? You, you? Some of you that are maybe new to faith, new to Jesus, and you don't know how to pray. Can I tell you, just, just talk to God like you would talk to a friend. It's that simple. You got something going on with your car? You got your car, something broke down, you say, Lord... Oh, my alternator or something in my car is not going. I don't understand it. And can you help me figure this out? Get me the right mechanic and get this thing solved. Just talk to God like you talk. Say, Lord, you know, I don't understand what's going on in this election. I don't understand what's going on in politics. Lord, can you just help reveal, help, help me to respond to my family in the right way? Just talk to God like you talk to a friend. Let's be strong in prayer. Those of you are online. Maybe you're at, at home and you want to get together as a family and maybe that's not, uh, not a normal thing in your home that you should pray more, you know it. But maybe husbands and wives and kids in your own home, you need to get together and you need to pray when you go home in this room. You need to say, we, we just need to spend a, little, a, a few moments in prayer. It doesn't have to be long. We're not here to try to prove how long we can pray or how great prayers. We don't need to pray King James prayers. You know, you know what those are? If thou willest, God beest and helpest with, you know, I, you know whatever. Just talk to God. But... In your homes, I want to challenge you, challenging you online. Let's return prayer, husbands and wives praying together, praying with your kids, praying with those that are around you. Let's pray like we've never prayed before. Daniel stood strong in the face of peers and authorities. In Daniel's case, the government didn't know God. There are politicians and citizens who either have or want to have the government be put in place of God. And, and it's whatever the government says I'm going to do. They treat God, the government like God. He does. But Daniel took a stand. He says, I'm going to pray anyway. I'm going to worship no matter what the government says, no matter what the edicts say, no matter what the decree said. He says, I'm going to pray and God will deliver me. 
So let me end this message, this part of this message. I'm going to finish it next week. I have three more points to go. Let me just finish it this way. Are you willing to stand alone? Are you willing to go against the grain? Like Daniel. In the face of everybody else in culture, in the face of his government, in the face of written decrees, he said, I'm willing to stand alone. We're entering time, and even with your family, this is difficult. And I, I want to say this, don't go picking fights. We don't need to do that. But when we're pressed, you need to be able to say that you believe in God. You need to be able to say, I believe in Jesus. Jesus is my deliverer. He's my savior. He's going to protect me. He's going to be with me. And you need to speak up. We need to say what God puts on our heart to say. We don't need to cower. We don't need to sit back. We need to do what God's called us to do. You can, in this text, Daniel didn't go pick, pick and fights with anybody. This stuff came to him and he had to respond. We're entering a time, church, where you're going to have to stand alone. I don't care. It doesn't matter what your friends do. There's a lot of peer pressure. Peer pressure can come to adults. It's what, what they do. You've got to stand alone. So my close this morning, can I just challenge us? Can we be Daniel 6 believers? Walk in real faith. Say, I'm going to have Daniel kind of faith. I'm going to have Daniel 6 kind of faith. I'm going to believe God's going to be with me. He's going to deliver me. No matter what I say, no matter what I'm faced with, whether it's in my home or in the community, I'm going to stand with God. And just like he delivered Daniel from the lion's den, guess what? He's going to take care of you and me. That's the kind of God that we serve. Let's stand together this morning. Ah, Lord, we thank you. God, we praise you. Lord, I thank you for the people that I have the privilege to pastor. I thank you they're strong people. I thank you that, God, you birthed in them your spirit. And, Lord, they're believers in Jesus. If they're not this morning, I pray they'd surrender their heart and life to you. They, they'd, be, they'd serve the God that has this kind of power to deliver even when somebody's submitted to a lion's den. The, the God that can shut the mouths of lions and silence them. That's the kind of God that we serve. Lord, I pray in the midst of when oppression is around us and difficulties around us, I pray that the people within the sound of my voice, those listening online, those in this room, they'd walk out of this room de determined to be strong in you, not weak in you. Because you, not strong in ourselves, not in our own whatever, but strong in you. God, we trust you today. May our faith be like Daniel's. May we believe wholeheartedly. May we trust you wholeheartedly with our lives. In your name I pray. With every head bowed and every eye closed, no one looking around. Nobody looking good from privacy to everyone right now. How many in this room would say, Pastor, I've been challenged and I want to have a new level of faith to stand right now. Just, just raise your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me in a closing prayer. Everybody, i got my hand up. I want to have more of a faith to stand. i got my hand up this morning. That's you, many hands, uh, multiple hands up there. Yeah. You can put those hands down. I wonder if it just... Nobody, if there's somebody in this room by chance that you have never given your life to this God that I've talked about today. I didn't talk about the salvation of Jesus so much today, but just like God delivered Daniel, he, he sent Jesus to deliver us from our sins and our waywardness. He's here to set you free from your sin today and to come into your life and be your savior. And I wonder if this room, if there's somebody or online you're listening and you've not surrendered your life to Jesus Christ and you need to do that this morning. Would you just slip up your right hand and say, Pastor, I'm not sure, but I want to make sure I've given my life to Jesus. Just raise your hand right now. That's me. Say, Pastor, you're talking to me right now. I want to know this God you're talking about right now. Hallelujah. Maybe everyone in this room's a believer. Could be. Hallelujah. You can all look at me right now. I want to just challenge you this week as we go. I'm going to finish this up next week. And uh, I want to talk about, there's, there's a pathway in here that talks about the, the day and the culture of which we live and we find ourselves even in the midst of this election that I'll unfold to you next Sunday morning. So I reckon some of you may be out of town and whatnot, but let's just come together. Let's study God's word. I encourage you to go home, read this whole chapter yourself, and you gather it into your spirit, the things that apply to your life, and, and be strong in him. Love every one of you, and uh, go have a great Thanksgiving, and let's be strong in the Lord. Lord bless you.
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we get his 